Hello, and welcome to our online lecture for Psych 1101 and Psych 1010 at Lanier Technical College. My name is Michael Holman, I am a psychology instructor here at Lanier Tech, and I will be your narrator. Please note that these lectures are intended to assist you in better understanding the material, and should not be considered a substitute for attending lecture, reading the text, or completing your assignments. This time around, we're going to talk about stress, health, and adjustment. So we will define stress and identify various sources of stress. We'll identify the psychological moderators of stress. We will describe the impact of stress on the body. Explain the relationship between psychology and health. So true or false, some stress is good for us. This is true. Vacations can be stressful. This is also true. Searching for social approval or perfection is an excellent way of making yourself miserable. This is also true. Type A people achieve more than type B people, but they are less satisfied with themselves. This is false. Humor helps us cope with stress. This is true. At any given moment, countless microscopic warriors within our bodies are carrying out search and destroy missions against foreign agents. This is true. If you have a family history of heart disease or cancer, there is little or nothing you can do to prevent developing the illness yourself. This is false. So stress, what is it and where does it come from? Well, stress is a demand made on an organism to adapt, cope, or adjust. Among stress, there is actually good stress. It's known as eustress. It's healthful stress. It's the kind of stress that pushes us to get things done, to take care of ourselves. But when we have intense or prolonged stress, it affects our moods, it impairs our ability to experience pleasure, and it harms the body. Health psychology is a field of psychology that studies the relationships between psychological factors and the prevention and treatment of physical health problems. When talking about stress, we start first with daily hassles. Daily hassles are regularly occurring conditions and experiences that can threaten or harm our well-being. They occur in our household, in our health, and time pressure, inner concerns, environmental issues, financial responsibilities, work, and even security hassles. Traffic is a great example of a daily hassle, or making sure that you have to get a report in every day by a certain time. That's a daily hassle. It's something that you always have to get done, but it still is gonna kinda add a little bit of stress to your day. Life changes can be either good or bad and occur regularly. So these are just changes in your life, exactly what they sound like. So getting married, starting a new job, starting your first day at college, uh, having a breakup, any number of things, they're all considered life changes and they can all be quite stressful even if they're good or bad. So with hassles and life changes, we know that these will affect our moods and can be used to predict certain health problems. Holmes and Rahay also came up with the idea of life change units, which essentially said that the more stressful events going on in your life, so whether they're life changes or daily hassles, those are like bricks. And the more bricks that you have, the more stress you have in your life. An online survey was commissioned by the American Psychological Association, and this created a representative sample of the American population. And we learned quite a bit of information about stress in America as a result. For example, the most significant source of stress for most Americans in 2009 was money at 71%. Work is just below that at 69%. Personal safety was the least amount of significant sources of stress, which in a way is kind of a good thing that only 27% of those polled said that, because otherwise it would mean that most Americans feared for their safety. 
When asked about what physical symptoms they feel when stressed out, the number one was irritability or anger. So most people, when they're stressed, get irritable or angry. They might also feel fatigue at 43%, or they might even feel a lack of interest in motivation or energy. Notice down here at the bottom that the least amount of physical symptoms happened with 3% being erectile dysfunction or a change in menstrual cycle happening at 4%. So those are the least likely uh, symptoms for physical stress. When talking about psychological symptoms of stress, the best way that people actually manage their stress, which is really what this graph is about, is by listening to music. 49% of those that were participating in this survey said that they listened to music in order to deal with their stress. 44% exercise or walk, 41% read. And then let's look at what people do the least. Meditation or yoga is only 7%. Gambling is 4% and isn't this interesting? Seeing a mental health professional is 4%. So mental health professionals, people that have gone to school and it's their entire job to help you deal with these kinds of stressors, are the least used in terms of helping people to deal with their stress. Isn't that interesting? When we asked people to share the impact of stress on sleep and eating habits, we found that 36% of participants skipped a meal, 43% ate too much, and 48% said they would lay awake at night because of how stressed out they were. When talking about stress, we often need to talk about conflict. This is the feeling of being pulled in two or more directions by opposing motives. So you want one thing and you want another, but I feel like I'm being pulled in two different ways. So what do I do? Well, there are four types of conflicts. There's approach approach, which means that you want one thing and you want another. So usually getting one means you won't get the other. And so you have to decide. And so that creates conflict. There's also avoidance, avoidance. I'm trying to avoid this. I'm also trying to avoid that. But if I avoid one, it will make the other happen. There's also approach avoidance conflict. This is characterized by wanting one thing, but wanting to avoid something else. And multiple approach avoidance is simply having a whole bunch of issues. And some of them you want to avoid, and some of them you actually want to happen but making one decision can make a whole bunch of different things happen that you don't want. CBT and REBT especially like to focus on combating irrational beliefs in order to help people deal with the stress that they go through on a daily basis. Irrational beliefs are combated using something in REBT, uh, which is the Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy um, School of Psychology known as the ABC model. This is A for activating event, B for belief, and C for consequences. The founder of this theory was Albert Ellis, and he said that a negative activating event becomes more aversive over time because irrational beliefs compound the effects. So essentially what he's saying is that something happened. You do not like this thing, this event that happened in your life. After this event happened, you made it worse because of your beliefs about that event, and now you have to deal with the consequences of your actions. So let's look at this. Here's an example. Let's say that you text a friend, and you texted that friend, but now they're not responding to any of your texts. That is the activating event. Friend is not responding to my text. Your belief might be, my friend hates me, they don't like me anymore, they're talking about me, uh, I must have done something to really upset them. That is your belief. And because you are so focused on that belief, what do you do as a result of that belief? Well, you might continue texting them. Or you might accuse them and be like, why are you ignoring me now? Or maybe you start talking about them to other people. Or you, maybe you get sad because your friend is no longer talking to you and you believe they hate you even though the only thing that really happened was that your friend didn't text you back. That's an irrational belief. And so Albert Ellis and his uh, ABC model 
would try to demonstrate to people how this irrational belief can cause us to become more stressed out about our lives than we really need to be. Another behavior pattern we want to look at is type A versus type B behavior patterns. Type A people are highly driven, they're competitive, they're impatient, they're hostile, and they're aggressive. Type B people relax more readily and focus more on the quality of life, but are less ambitious and less impatient. Type A people may be very hostile and aggressive, but they also are the ones more likely to get things done. While type B people are much more relaxed and laid back, but are much less likely to actually accomplish certain goals. So how do we control our stress? Well, there are a lot of different ways. Number one, we have certain self-efficacy expectations. Good rule of thumb, write this down. Whenever you see the word self-efficacy, it means self-esteem. This allows someone to persist in difficult tasks and endure discomfort because you have higher self-esteem. High self-esteem expectations will cause less adrenaline and noradrenaline to be secreted when you are under stress. It helps to moderate your body's stress levels, and this becomes very important. Many people are what we call psychologically hardy. These people are more resistant to stress. For example, in one survey, we surveyed people found to be psychologically hardy that were business executives, and they seem to have high commitment they were high in wanting challenges, and they also had a high sense of being control or being in control over their own lives. They had a more internal locus of control. The locus of control is essentially a concept of how much control do you have over the events that occur in your life. An external locus of control means that you have no control whatsoever. And an internal locus of control means that you are responsible for everything that happens to you, both good and bad. We tend to suggest that most people fall somewhere more moderate in the middle, but still lean towards an internal locus of control, rather than saying that nothing is my fault, for example. We also know that a sense of humor is very effective in helping people deal with stress. Research suggests that humor moderates stress effects. Laughter can stimulate endorphin outputs, which can create more pleasure, which means less stress. And humor helps you have positive cognitive shifts. So you can at least at laugh about your situation, even if it is a bad situation. So remember, cognitive means thinking. So the more humor that you have, the more likely you are to have more positive mental shifts in the way you think about your situation. We also want to talk about predictability and control. Knowing that a stressful situation is predictable allows us to prepare and cope. Control, even the illusion of control, allows us to plan. And if we believe we have a plan, then we have at least some kind of hope, right? It's not all out of our control and there's nothing we can do and so we're just going to allow ourselves to be washed away by the angry waters of our lives. No, we at least need to think that there's something that we can do in case the worst case happens. Social support is also incredibly important when dealing with stress. Social support acts as a buffer against the effects of stress and has been shown to help people resist infectious diseases. It also helps people cope with the stress of acculturation, remember that's moving to a new environment, and or dealing with other health problems. So we've talked a lot about how to deal with stress and where stress comes from, but how does stress really affect the body? Well, there's one thing known as general adaptation syndrome. This is a group of bodily changes that occur in three stages. The alarm reaction, so something has stressed you out and now you're aware of it, you're aroused. The resistance stage, where you are continuing to fight whatever is happening. And then the exhaustion stage, where you just kind of wear yourself out being so stressed out. This is triggered by the perception of a stressor and it arouses the body. That's the alarm reaction of the general adaptation syndrome. During this time, corticosteroids will help protect your body and combat allergic reactions and produce inflammation. Adrenaline is released which provides fuel for the fight or flight reaction. 
So at this point, everything is just acting normally. Alarm reactions are perfectly normal in every person. The hypothalamus secretes cord yeah, I always have trouble with this word, corticotrophin releasing hormones, or CRH. CRH causes the pituitary gland to secrete adrenocorticotrophic hormones, or ACTH. ACTH then causes the adrenal cortex to secrete corticosteroids, and the adrenal medulla releases a mixture of adrenaline and noradrenaline. There are some alternatives to the universality of the alarm reaction. Not everybody responds with fight or flight. For example, many women will engage in tend and befriend responses to threats. So instead of wanting to fight it or run away from it, they might instead try to make it an ally so it is no longer a threat. A productive response is used when instead of having an alarm reaction, you pull back from the situation and reappraise it. This allows you to decide, is this really a stressful event or am I making it worse than it actually is? This is part of cognitive adaptation theory and the conservation of resources theory. Next we have the resistance stage of GAS. If the alarm reaction mobilizes the body and the stressor has not been removed, then endocrine and sympathetic nervous system activity continues higher than normal. So during the resistance stage, all of that stuff that was pumped out during the alarm stage just keeps getting pumped out. And that leads us to the exhaustion stage of GAS. Now the stressor has not been dealt with adequately. Your muscles have become fatigued. You've been in fight or flight this whole time. Your parasympathetic division of your ANS is dominating everything, and your continued stress can lead to diseases of adaptation. Things like allergies, hives, coronary heart disease, and ultimately death if something is not done about this prolonged stress. When comparing the difference between men and women, we know that women under stress are more likely to demonstrate tend and befriend, as we've already said, which shows that women have been socialized to be more nurturing and to seek social support. There's also an evolutionary explanation for this difference. Uh, women tended to be uh, the caretakers of children, and so it made more sense with men out hunting and things of that nature that they might instead make allies of others so that they could help defend themselves as a unit. Males are more aggressive due to hormone differences. Your immune system helps you combat disease. It produces white blood cells called leukocytes, which kill pathogens in your body. They also generate antibodies that are used to battle antigens. Inflammation increases leukocytes sent to the injured area. Stress stimulates the production of steroids, and steroids interfere with the formation of antibodies and decrease inflammation. For example, in one study, dental students had lower immune system functioning during stressful periods of the school year, like finals week. Students with friends, however, showed less immune system suppression. So having friends really can change your life. Let's take a look real quick at psychology and chronic health problems. So how does having chronic health problems relate to your mental state? Well, when looking at the biopsychosocial approach to health, we know that the likelihood of contracting an illness can reflect the interaction of biological, psychological, and sociocultural factors. Biologically, we're talking about genetic predispositions. Does cancer or heart disease run in your family? Then yes, you'll be dealing with that as well. But psychologically, we're talking about your attitudes, your emotions, and even your behaviors. Coronary heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. Risk factors include your family history, physiological conditions, patterns of consumption, so are you eating a lot of red meat, having more type A behavior, and having hostility and holding in those feelings of anger. You also have to think about your job strain. If you have chronic fatigue, stress, anxiety, depression, or emotional strain, having sudden stressors, and having a physically inactive lifestyle, all of these can contribute to coronary heart disease. Cancer also has several risk factors and is also related to stress. Things like an inherited disposition, behavior patterns such as smoking, drinking more alcohol or sunbathing, and prolonged psychological conditions such as depression or stress. And that is 
pretty much it when it comes to stress and health. Please make sure that you are completing all of your assignments by the due date, and I will see you next time for the next lecture.